you think was the wealthiest man over the last 600 years ever in the world? We've got Rothschild. I heard of Rockefeller. Carnegie. So there's a man named Jacob Fugar who in today's dollars earned $400 billion net worth by his 36th birthday. And he did it by building copper mines in the 1400s. So today we're gonna to talk about copper. And um, <laughs> sitting to my left is, is one of Canada's top entrepreneurs. And without question, um, I would say the most successful entrepreneur in the mining business. And somebody who's made a lot of money in the copper sector and a lot of money for his shareholders in the <laughs> copper sector. We were both on stage yesterday at the same time and I pretty much talked about you the whole time. So um, in uh, 2001, 2003, uh, Ross Beatty picked up a handful of copper assets back when copper was trading under a dollar and subsequently spun those into six different companies which he sold for a collective 1.4 billion um, a few years later. Ross, thanks so much for joining me here today. Thank you, Jay. Happy to be here. And, uh, and on the far left, I know he loves being described that way, <laughs> the far left is uh, Rick Rule. And uh, the reason I wanted Rick on this panel is back in 2014, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in this business uh, and who I should be in this industry. And I flew down to Carlsbad and I, I talked to Rick and I said, Rick, if you were me right now in this industry, what would you do with your career? And you kind of sat back in your chair and you said, well, Jay, look, I can tell you what I did do. What I did was find the most promising entrepreneurs in the business and then make myself indispensable to them. And then he listed off a couple entrepreneurs and Ross's name was at the top of the list. And then he said, look, if I only ever invested in like three or four entrepreneurs my entire career, I would have made 10 times as much money and worked half as hard, all right? So I had my marching orders. I knew what I should do. And a year later, Ross Beatty was on my stage being interviewed by Marin Katusa. And Marin asked him, Ross, who's an entrepreneur in this business that everybody should pay attention to? And Ross said, Ivan Bebek in the middle seat here. So that's how we all ended up here today. All right, you guys ready to get started? All right. Before we do though, before we do, uh, I think that we need to acknowledge uh, the ascent uh, of a wonderful young voice and conference promoter by the name of Jay Martin. If you could give a hand for our host, please. Thank you, Rick. M much appreciated. Um, it's super fun. So we're going to talk copper today. And um, let's start with the macro outlook. Maybe... Um, Ross, can I pass it to you to kick this one off? Sure, thanks, Jay, and good morning, everybody. Um, well, quite frankly, I'm not even sure why I'm here, because, uh, because uh, copper was my, my story, you know, a few years ago with all the Lumina companies, um, but today it's gold, and so, you know, I happen to love gold. Like, of all the metals, that's my number one commodity, and after that, probably would be silver, and after that, for sure, copper. So it's, it's still in the top three, and it's, and it's not, just, um, not just the commodity, it's... it's it's where the commodity is in the price cycle. So today, what, copper is trading for 375, give or, give or take? So is it going to double? Um, I'm not sure it's gonna double. I mean, there's a fair bit of copper in the world. Um, it's a very valuable metal for all sorts of things. Mostly today, it's in the electricity world, right? It's, it's a, a critical metal for the whole energy transition we're in from energy generation, energy transmission, and ultimate end use in, in a, just a variety, you know, thousands of things. So it's a super important metal. It's definitely a, it's, it's the critical metal for the energy transition more than anything else. Um, but there's a lot of copper in the world. So just to maybe sum up my own views, copper is, is, a, is a great metal. It's my third favorite metal today. It's at a reasonable price. Um, and I think copper exploration and development companies should do pretty well. It's, it's a good metal. Uh, I happen to like gold more, but there you go. All right, th thank you, Ross. And Ivan, I'll pass it to you, Com company builder. What's your take on the copper market today? Sure, um, 20 years ago, when I got in the business, copper was uh, around well below a dollar per pound and grades were a lot higher. And right now the grades have come down considerably from where they were, but it's even harder now to find a high quality, high grade copper mine in the world than it ever has been before, because a lot of the easy ones have been found. And to Ross's point, 
There's no shortage of copper in the world, but there's a shortage of quality copper in the world, and that's the big variance. The second thing is the ESG initiatives that we're all aware of and we all adhere to have slowed down the pace that it takes to dig a big hole in the ground and build a major copper mine. And the third point, if you look at some of the top 10 copper mines in the world, I think three of them will expire in the next 15, 20 years. So it has a perpetual performing outlook as a price of a commodity. I'm driven by discovery. Copper happens to be the metal. I love gold. I'm a gold bug. I'm a copper bull. It's a long-term performing asset, but quality is what you have to add to the phrase. And I think copper is essential. As we all see the population grow, the modernization, the electrification, it's going to be a key metal going forward, as recently described as a critical metal in the U.S. It's been qualified recently. So I'm a huge bull on copper, but I'm a bigger bull on discoveries, and I think we have a chance at both. And Rick, same question. I had the good fortune some years ago to get a call from Ross Beatty when he was building Lumina. I think I was shareholder number two. And I had uh, I'd been through a couple of adventures with Ross, and they had happy endings. And so I was going to do the deal anyway, but I had the good fortune to, the day after I talked to Ross, talk to a guy named Jim Bob Moffat, uh, another great entrepreneur who built the Freeport Mac Moran companies. And in the course of the conversation, I said, uh, you know, Jim Bob, just talk to me about copper. He said, well, I'm agnostic as to commodities, but if you look around the world at great big mines, mines that make a million dollars a day or two million dollars a day, most of them are copper mines. And for that reason, I like copper because I like to make a lot of money as opposed to a little money. He said, the best business in extractive industries is in oil and gas because it's a bigger business and it's a better business and there's smarter people. The second best is copper. And I thought about that. Uh, and I thought about the success that Ross had buying out of the money, well, first buying out of the money silver deposits in Pan American. And then when that worked, buying out of the money copper deposits, uh, and for that reason, I'm like Jim Bob. I'm, well, I'm not quite commodity agnostic. I like gold. I've got to admit that. But I, I like money. Uh, and I note, in my life, great big deposits, if they yield you a surprise, yield you a good surprise. And little deposits, if they yield you a surprise, yield a bad surprise, and there's not enough reserve life to overcome the surprise. Uh, at 70, I know that surprises are inevitable, and I'd prefer good surprises to bad surprises. So I like the copper business for that reason. If you look around the world at the great big mines that make boatloads of money, probably what, other than iron ore, probably 60% of them copper mines. So that's why I like it. And Ivan, if you were to get a bit more granular with the supply and demand fundamentals in the copper sector right now, um, it looks like you know, there, there might even be sort of a, a you know, net balance in 2024, and then a significant deficit starts to spread in 26, which then really, really amplifies over the next 10 years. Um, main trigger points for creating that demand, and then if you could touch on the difference in getting new supply to market in copper relative to the gold sector. Sure. Um, well, I haven't, I actually have taken one gold mine to production, but um, the time frame to bring a copper mine online is, is really slow. Um, I'll give you an example. We're looking for a big copper mine, one with, that would meet the thresholds of some of the larger mines in the world. It'll probably be 20 or 30 years if we're successful before that mine comes to market to have a huge impact on supply, assuming it's the quality that I'm, I'm advertising here that we need. So time frame to discovery is, is not going to meet the actual supply issues that are, we're facing with various mines running out of metal. The other factor is those big holes in the ground in Chile, some of those larger mines, the deeper you go, the more expensive it is. So there's a cost factor as well. So I think that the, the big thing to be more granular about it is the, the time to meet supply demand needs. As demand is increasing, it's just not going to be met in a timely manner. I don't think the globe was ready for the copper demand they're going to create to try and modernize and have the electrification from a mining or exploration perspective. We're at the slowest end of the spectrum making a big discovery. That's the biggest reward as a shareholder. But from this point forward, once you make it, it's a long road to meet those demands. And Ross, you're nodding along there with a couple of those points at the end. Um, the shareholder experience, what, what was catching your attention? Well, the thing, the thing that uh, Ivan said that was correct, and, and actually to some degree, Rick, is that uh, copper is different than, say, gold or even silver or many other metals in that 
uh, most copper mines of the world are, there's very few of them, first of all. There's not very many copper mines. There's probably 20 times more gold mines than copper mines. And the reason for that is that, you know, most copper deposits are really big. These, these deposits called porphyry coppers. Like Highland Valley, I don't know if any of you have been up to, to the interior of BC near Merritt and have driven along, I forget the name of the highway, it's Highway 15 or something, but it goes right through um, uh, Tex Highland Valley uh, ore body and it's absolutely humongous. You drive by these tailings dams in the, the open pit for miles and miles and miles. These are giant ore bodies and they create giant wealth for decades and decades. Highland Valley has been going since the 60s. So, um, you know, to build a copper mine these days costs billions of dollars. Uh, First Quantum just built one in Panama, it cost $6 billion. Tech just finished an expansion of one in Chile, it cost $8 billion. So, you know, from the standpoint of junior investing, if, you, if you're a junior company and you lock into one of these big copper deposits, as to Ivan's point, it takes years and years and years to explore them develop them, but very few juniors, and there are exceptions, there are some exceptions, they're not very common, very few juniors have the money to be able to afford the capital cost to build those mines. So the strategy for those companies really is only develop and sell. It's not a bad strategy, it works pretty well. But if, if you're an investor, you've got to try to lock into those companies that have the potential to sell themselves to large companies with the capital capacity to build mines. And I can think of a handful that are out there but uh, the smaller companies, to Rick's point, the smaller companies that have small deposits will, will probably never um, really mature into anything significant in the copper game, whereas they might in the silver game or the gold game. But the copper game's different because the, these ore bodies are big. Now, there are exceptions. There's smaller, really high grade, high margin copper deposits around where you can, you know, you can build a mine that's relatively small, but it's high margin, makes, makes some good money, and small companies can maybe do that but it's not like gold. Ross, I wanted to follow up with you on a, on a point here. So as you mentioned, copper is the key ingredient in the renewable energy transition. Um, a lot of narrative around this transition right now, it's kind of tough to determine what's actually a realistic goal and what isn't. Um, you've built a billion dollar business in the renewable energy sectors. So you've got better eyes on it, I think, than, than our, our politicians might have. What's your take on our... Uh, our, our, our energy goals, how realistic are these? You say there's lots of copper, but is it accessible right now and is the challenge actually getting it out of the earth? Uh, what's your take on that, please? That's a good question, Jay. And I have been a, a real skeptic of a lot of this rubbish that I hear spoken by politicians and, and dreamers, or especially economists. I mean, they have absolutely no clue about the fundamentals of the, of the mining business. You know, they go on, oh, we're gonna need five times more copper and 15 times more lithium and 85 more times more rare earth metals to satisfy energy demand. If we, if we increase renewable energy, you know, three times, we're gonna need all these multiple times more, more metals. And, and, you know, they have no idea, A, how difficult it is to find, and, and, and two feasibility studies, and permit, and finance, and then build, or the time frame, quite frankly. And they're using, um, you know, all forecasts are based on assumptions. And most of these assumptions are completely crazy. So I discount them right away. Um, so, you know, and of course all that hype feeds into certain, you know, you get newspaper headlines, you, people who, 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 who read things get, get all excited about, about the need for more critical metals and so they go and buy companies' stocks that, that, that happen to be lithium stocks or cobalt stocks or, or whatever. And what we've seen in the real world is the hype has driven metal prices high in 2000, 2001, 2002 with all this hype that was going on and they absolutely cratered last year. I mean, last year, lithium prices went down a, a ton, cobalt went down, everything went on except copper. Mm. So copper stayed relatively high because copper is not just a hype story, it's a fundamental story. And it's a story that's fundamental with respect to demand, not just for the energy transition, but a thousand other things, you know, plumbing and, and wiring of all manner of things and, and, and metal construction, bronze and brass and, it's got so many uses in, in, and that's why it's called Dr. Copper, because it really, the price of copper has traditionally, you know, gone up and down with economic cycles, and you can predict what's going to happen to the economy if you look at the copper price. That's why it's called Dr. Copper. Uh, well, you can add on to that Dr. Copper, you know, truly it is an energy metal. It's as, it's as an important an energy metal as, as any other metal in the periodic table. So it is the critical metal 
but it's got all these other things going as well. And you're right, you can build almost nothing without it. If we want to electrify anything, we need a lot more of it. So what's your take on the, the deficit spread between supply and demand over like a 10-year time horizon, Ross? Regardless of how realistic many of these you know, electric vehicles only by 2035 goals sound, what's your take on the deficit spread? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm not bullish. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a sort of a, a, a tout on copper. I'm not, a, I'm not a copper, an irrational copper bull, but I'm bullish on copper, if, if you know the distinction. Um, so... The copper demand story is a very sound and profoundly uh, important one for the next 10 years, I'd say. So that's going to keep copper prices very strong. They're not going to go crazy, but they're going to be very strong. And at today's price, or anything better than today's price, copper companies are mostly making really good margins. Their operating costs are about half of what today's revenue gives them, and that's a really good spread. So they're doing well, and I don't see that changing negatively. I see it changing, if anything, positively, but nothing crazy. Okay, I wanted to ask, because on our last panel, we spent a long time talking about time horizon and how a lot of investors today think they're investors, but they operate like traders, and they're not actually investing as much as they're just trading share prices and hoping to catch a swing, um, which is not the strategy that I would recommend. And as we spoke about in the previous panel, if you're investing today, it might be smart to be investing for 2030. I mean, that's a great goal, right? Uh, which speaks to everything Ross just shared about, about Time Horizon. Rick, anything you'd share on that and how you might allocate capital with that in mind? Well, I, I think that's a great point. In the copper business, there's a wonderful deposit in Arizona called Resolution. Uh, it was discovered when I was Jay's age, which I'll tell you how long ago that was. It's been 25 years in permitting, and BHP figures another five to seven years in permitting. So think 30 years to put a big copper mine in the U.S. into production. And you need to adjust your timelines accordingly. It's appropriate that we have Ross Beatty here. I was trying to back test uh, some of my experience with Ross going back to 1988, which is, I think, the first time I wrote a check to a Ross Beatty company. 83? I discovered, I've, I think I've invested in 14 Ross Beatty companies now. And I've had really strange love sort of outcomes, fantastic outcomes. But it turns out, and I think in 14 companies I experienced, I'm going to say 8 to 10, 10 baggers, which is lovely. That experience, I'm just talking about my experience with Ross, <laughs> maybe the best of my experiences. The median holding period has been six years, and every single company has delivered me a 50% decline in share price before I got my 10-bagger. So to be in this racket to make a 10-bagger, you got to understand that although your preference would be not to hold stock over a long weekend, you're going to have to hold it for at least half a decade, and the probability is that the share price is going to fall precipitously at some point in time during the time you own it. So you have to consistently reassess your reasons for making the investment and whether or not the share price adequately reflects the ultimate probability of success. We're, I mean, we have Ross up here right now. A wonderful example, I think, is his current effort, Equinox Gold. The market is expressing skepticism about on-time, on-budget delivery in Northern Ontario. If they achieve that, I suspect, this isn't Ross talking, this is me talking, that the stock doubles uh, or better. Meanwhile, in the last 18 months, I've experienced a 50% decline in share price. Am I happy about that? Actually, yeah, uh, because I checked my own precept for buying it and decided, nope, the market's wrong. I'm right, <laughs> doesn't always work that way. Uh, I gotta buy some more. And in the copper business in particular, if your mindset isn't five years or six years or 10 years, and if you aren't tenacious enough to suffer through 30 or 40 or 50% price declines during the period of time you hold it, you need to buy savings bonds or something. You need to be way, way, way out of this space. Okay, I want to I wanna stick with this point just for a minute longer because I think it's so important and the way you become tenacious enough to stick through 30% declines in the share price 
is by having conviction in your time horizon, right? And we, we spoke about this half an hour ago, but if you're investing for 2030 per se, then yes, if in a year you're down And you've got to work really hard. You know, when the Equinox share price declined, Ross has proved to be too polite to tell you how many times I called him and said, Ross, are we really truly on time on budget? <laughs> uh, you know, because for me, the variable here is the industry looks at, the investment community looks at the investment track record of mine developers in Northern Ontario in the last five years, and it's virtually unblemished by success. You know, uh, and everybody is saying, well, Ross's team is probably just as stupid as the other teams. I've watched this team build mines now for 25 years, and I, there are a lot of things, but they ain't stupid. Uh, but you have to do the work so that you have the courage of your convictions. If your strategy has got a hunch, bet a bunch, when the share price declines, you aren't going to have the emotional stability to hold the stock or better yet, buy more. Ivan, I want to point it over to you now. You know, we've heard the investor angle. You can stick with that because you're an investor and always the biggest investor in your own deals, which is the best news. Uh, but from a company builder standpoint as well, what would you share on that point? So you just heard from two of my mentors and people I followed and modeled a lot of things I do after. They talked about time horizon and they talked about 50% loss before things go up. That just described the hardest market to finance in possible as an entrepreneur trying to go after a long-term project. But even though capital is really hard to find, the metals and the asset is still 10 times harder to find than the capital. And that's something that all of you have to realize in this room. I've raised a lot of money. I've been in this business for 24 years. I think 700 million I've been involved in financings as needed for juniors. I've seen good markets, I've seen bad markets. Last November was the worst I've seen to date. But the asset I'm chasing, I've chased for eight years and it's been the best asset I think I've chased so far in my career. But the challenge of 50% losses with legendary entrepreneurs like Ross Beatty, where it's going to be a huge win with Equinox, as it has been in all his other companies, that makes it harder for us. And then going after something that could take 20, 30 years to put in production. So capital is tough to find, but the assets are harder. If you look at the quality of Ross's teams and what he has created, if you look at a lot of the companies Rick's invested into, nobody gives credit the value of those teams, their abilities, and the perseverance and tenacity. I think you used that word earlier, Rick, the tenacity needed. So I'm a, I'm a fearless explorer. I'm aware that if you find something big enough and good enough to go after, you do whatever it takes. You write as much checks as you can. You get as many people to support you to give you a shot at something that could result as many of Ross's success have resulted into. So yesterday in my workshop, rule number three for anybody who attended three, ba five basic rules for every resource investor. Rule number three was people over everything every single time, right? And this is when I mentioned Ross, I said he's the broken slot machine, 15 companies, 15, 10 baggers. There's nobody in the business like that, full stop, ever. Now, our job as investors is to find the next Ross Beatties. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it yet, Ivan. You got, you got some work to do, but look, as I said, I'm not opposed to betting on the rookie. Most of my career, I've been the rookie soliciting bets, but, you know, I want to bet on the individual who's at least put the puck in the net once or twice, right? Once is lucky, two has my attention, three, we know we're on a streak. Um, Ivan, Caden Resources, you built and sold for a 5x return. Keegan Resources, you built and sold for an 18x return. I want to give you the opportunity right now to walk my audience through what you're, what you're building with Copernico. Yeah, so, so Keegan didn't, it ended up being a mine. We didn't sell it, but it went to $9 per share, so it was a... Uh, it was the first one that worked, and, and yeah, luck is about probably 60, 70 percent of a, of a good discovery, and I'll fully say that. Team is the rest. Um, the case of Copernico, I started my career with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Roman Shkalenka as a mentor. Both uh, Rick and, and Ross actually know him, and uh, he, I sat with him for two hours a day for probably two and a half years, asking what every color on the page meant, how do you find the major minds? He's found six major mines around the planet, gold mines, and we looked at numerous assets. We had Oyo Togo on his desk before Friedland got it. And I fell in love with size and scale, and I fell in love with the merits of what make things go. Uh, we got into a project in Peru called Sombrero. We've been after it for eight years. We learned that it has a scale, it has the, the grade, it has vertical multi-kilometers of strike length, it has grade all over the surface, and it's caught the attention to probably three of the largest mining companies in the world, Recently, one of their uh, VP of explorations from uh, BHP just joined our board after he retired from BHP last year, and he invested into the company. And I only say that because my Kool-Aid will always have vodka in it. The longer you're on an asset that you like, 
the more you fall in love with that asset. But getting somebody's attention like that, it obviously has a deep knowledge technically, it gives us confidence. It's not gonna guarantee us success, but our first real target is an analog to Las Bombas, which is number nine or 10 in the world, copper mines. And that's what I'm trying to shape my next move off of. The time's been, it sucks. It sucks waiting. It sucks going through the bad markets. Shareholders get frustrated. They're very supportive. In our case, it's been forced because we're not trading yet, but we'll be trading soon. We're finally making it through that turn and we're gonna get a chance to drill some of the best holes that could deliver that potential near-term gratification of finding a metal that's becoming more and more challenging to find. So that's, that's the story. All right. Ross, can I give you the final word here? Anything else you'd like to share with the audience today? Well, I'm not going to give any, any names of, uh, of companies particularly, but I just, you know, I, and I'm, not as, I'm not as close to the copper space as I am, say, to the gold or the silver space, but um, the thing that's, that's interesting to me right now is that pretty much everything's on sale. There's just a lack of interest in the junior sector by retail and institutional investors writ large. Yes, there is some hype. There's some hype that goes on sometimes, like uranium right now is in a pretty, pretty lofty space. So uranium plays have been pretty successful. Um, that's probably not going to last because generally things come back to earth eventually. But um, the copper space specifically hasn't had that hype in it, and so you haven't had that that run. And so I would say today represents in the gold space extraordinary value, probably the best uh, value proposition for junior companies, if not the best in my career, one of the best in my career. So that's just today, everything's on sale. And in the copper space, to the same degree, companies like Ivan's, you know, if you, if you have a strategy to buy copper companies, buy a portfolio, buy the lending mining, buy the, buy the uh, copper nickel like, like, like Ivan's company, those kind of range, and then some in the middle. A portfolio is the way to go, I think. And, and just about everything, I think, is going to do okay this year. I'm very bullish on the prospects across the board for junior companies in 2024. So, so good luck, and I hope a year from now, you know, you have happier faces than you may have had for the last year or two. <laughs> Appreciate that, Ross. All right, thank you all so much for joining me up here on stage. Thank Let's you. give them a round of applause, everybody.